everyone. I'm Heather Sprouse. I'm the Ohio River Coordinator here with the West Virginia Rivers Coalition. Uh, thank you so much for joining today. So today on our 30 minute lunch and learn, we'll be talking about um, hydrogen and specifically blue hydrogen. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started. So blue hydrogen um, is what we'll be talking about today for about 15 minutes. You'll be hearing uh, first from me about some of the background of what hydrogen is, what some of the impacts of one specific type of hydrogen could be, and then some of the implications for West Virginia. And then you'll hear from my colleague Heather about um, some opportunities to take action, um, what some of the best practices could be with this new emerging issue and technology. Um, and it's going to be a lot of information for just 15 minutes. So we'll be leaving you all with a fact sheet that we'll share with you all in the chat in about halfway through before we open it up to questions. So we'll go ahead and get started. So first you might ask, what is hydrogen? And if you say, my only interaction with hydrogen was as a school child learning about it on the periodic table, that's perfectly okay because you would be right. It is the lightest element and the first element on the periodic table. It's also the most abundant. Um, and it's a key building block for common liquids and gases like water, H2O, and methane, CH4. Um, but hydrogen has a lot of potential as a fuel. And once it's broken apart from molecules like methane or water, um, by different energy resources, it can be used as a fuel. Um, but you might ask, how is this done? And when we talk about hydrogen, um, you might hear about it in a color scheme in a rainbow. And there's different ways to describe it, but for the sake of educating and communicating the basics of hydrogen, we're going to use a hydrogen rainbow today. Um, but there's different ways that people may communicate how hydrogen is produced or separated from different molecules like water or methane. Um, the first type of hydrogen, um, the first way that hydrogen can be produced is through something called green hydrogen. Um, it's taking surplus solar and wind to split water, H2O, into molecular parts, splitting it into hydrogen as used for fuel and a byproduct of oxygen. Um, they use this process called electrolysis to split water into those parts. Um, other ways to produce hydrogen through the same process of electrolysis is taking nuclear energy to split that water into the same molecular parts. However, more common that you might hear about today is um, using this process called steam reformation. And steam reformation um, takes natural gas and brings together methane from that natural gas and water through the steam reformation process to produce hydrogen and a byproduct of carbon dioxide. Um, and then in the case of a blue hydrogen production, it is captured and stored, that carbon dioxide, and then the hydrogen itself is used for a fuel. Um, when you hear about gray hydrogen, that same process is used taking a fossil fuel based energy source to bring together methane and water and produce hydrogen. But the catch is they don't capture the carbon byproduct. But for the sake of today's um, presentation, we're just focusing on blue hydrogen and um, you'll hear more about that in a minute. So you might ask, why does hydrogen as a whole matter? Why do we want to produce it? Well, hydrogen has the potential to fuel hard to decarbonize industries. Um, so for example, um, industries like aviation, chemical and steel manufacturing and shipping are going to be industries that will be essential in the future, but are going to be very difficult to decarbonize as we mitigate climate change and adapt to our changing world. Um, and using specifically green hydrogen or renewable energy-based hydrogen has a lot of potential because it's emission-free, um, where we said the only byproduct is oxygen. And it is soon to actually be less expensive than some of the fossil fuel-based forms of hydrogen. 
And even more, it's projected to be able to be manufactured in sufficient quantities to meet our needs. Um, but right now, currently, gray hydrogen, the fossil fuel-based hydrogen without capturing a carbon dioxide byproduct, is our most common form of hydrogen production. However, there has been talks lately about bringing blue hydrogen into West Virginia specifically. And that would be a fossil fuel-based hydrogen that captures the carbon dioxide byproduct and stores it through carbon capture and storage. And we'll get more into that in a little bit. But right now, we're going to be only talking about blue hydrogen. Um, and we heard about some of the benefits of green hydrogen a moment ago in the previous slide. But blue hydrogen is particularly relevant to us today because there has been political and industry pressure among some of our most powerful stakeholders in our state to bring um, this type of hydrogen production into West Virginia. And some of the risks that we're going to get into and some of the impacts that you might hear about in the coming slides are, well, first, if it's a fossil fuel-based or natural gas-based form of hydrogen, there's going to be an increased demand of natural or fracked gas. So that means there's going to be increased hydraulic fracking processes. Um, there's risks in that because um, to, to do fracking, there is a chemical mix that's injected into the ground that fractures the geology and captures the methane. Um, this generates a radioactive byproduct and has other risks of, of chemical toxins. Um, and we'll get more into that in a little bit. Um, another risk of developing specifically blue hydrogen or fossil fuel-based hydrogen is there will be a requirement of constructing hundreds, if not thousands of miles of pipelines to transport and sequester the carbon dioxide byproduct underground. Um, we have a lot of existing pipeline systems in West Virginia, yes. However, many of them are inadequate to enclose the hydrogen due to its small size and to do that safely. So there will be a need to construct many more pipelines to do this. Um, and even more, there are a number of health, water, climate, and community impacts throughout the entire life cycle of the blue hydrogen process, which we'll get into now. Uh, the first impact that we want to discuss today around blue hydrogen are the air and climate impacts. Um, first and foremost, uh, we have concerns about methane, and that is a potent greenhouse gas. Methane is released during fracking, and it also can leak during the hydrogen process. Um, and we know that from um, research by the Environmental Defense Fund that the oil and gas supply chain emissions of methane are actually much higher than those assumed by the Department of Energy or the EPA. Um, in fact, oil and gas systems across the country are estimated pr to produce 60% more methane than the EPA estimates that are um, currently published. Even more, um, the end stage of the blue hydrogen production um, in capturing and storing that carbon dioxide byproduct after the hydrogen fuel is produced um, has been proven to be um, very costly. It's, it's not been a proven technology to scale, and it um, is estimated to increase electricity costs significantly. Um, and even more, the, the technology is not perfect. There are still leaks of carbon dioxide in that capture and storage process. So some studies have even said that um, the carbon footprint um, of carbon dioxide capture and storage and of the blue hydrogen process is 20% larger than natural gas and coal. And in cases of using diesel oil, oil for heat, it's 60% larger than that source of energy. Um, so a lot of numbers, but the main takeaway is there are a number of, of air pollution concerns that we have when it comes to that blue hydrogen process. And we know that burning fossil fuels is a primary cause of climate change. So, um, and even the International Energy Agency has come out a few years ago saying that new fossil fuel infrastructure can't be developed if we want to avoid the worst climate impacts. An additional concern that we have around blue hydrogen are environmental justice impacts and the geographic based impacts. Um, there's exacerbated health impacts to places that are located around fracking, like in North Central West Virginia and the Ohio River Valley. And even more, those increased electric bills and direct pollution risks target communities that are located closest to the development. So 
Um, those communities nearest to the hydrogen production and the carbon capture and storage will experience impacts more than others. Um, and those localized impacts from the entire life cycle, from the fracking to the carbon capture and storage will disproportionately harm low-income communities and communities of color. Even more, some of the specific impacts that uh, communities could experience from increased fracking in the blue hydrogen life cycle include um, public exposure to dangerous chemicals. Um, many of these chemicals are proprietary or trade secret. So um, they're not required to be reported by industry on the amounts or types of chemicals being used. So toxic substances like PFAS or forever chemicals, which you may have heard about a lot, particularly in West Virginia lately, um, are pumped underground and can seep into the groundwater. Um, and there's also radioactive waste byproducts that threaten the health of local communities as well. Even more with more fracking, um, there is, can be more ethane production, which is a building block in, in plastic production. And from every stage of this plastics life cycle, um, it is a hazard to, to human health, including the transportation of these chemicals. As, as we've seen uh, as of late with the, um, the, the disaster of the train derailment in East Palestine and containing chemicals that were crucial to the plastic production life cycle, including uh, the production of PVC. We've seen already the risk of, of some of these uh, plastic, uh, chemicals essential for the production of plastic. And um, with more blue hydrogen production, more fracking, um, these risks are, are increased even more. Um, even further, uh, research has shown that there's higher cancer risks in counties with fracking. And of all of the counties that have fracking in West Virginia, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, um, every single one of those counties that has fracking in that county has greater than a one in one million cancer risk, which is above the EPA's level of concern for cancer risk. And even one of, of the counties in West Virginia has a, um, uh, several have um, a greater than one in 250,000 uh, cancer risk, and one even has a greater than one in 100,000 risk. Um, and that's relevant because few counties in the, the country have that same risk level. Even more as we see more fracking around the blue hydrogen, we'll see more radioactive waste and chemicals. We touched on the health impacts in the previous slide, but there are direct water impacts from those chemicals, given that they're injected and stored underground or in landfills. Um, there's a leakage risk and um, risk of groundwater and surface contamination. Even more with more hydrocarbon wells, there's the risk of methane infiltration into the aquifers, aquifers which degrades the watershed, poses a combustion risk, and um, also is an indicator of the presence of other toxic chemicals like volatile organic compounds in the leakage. Even more, as I mentioned earlier, there's going to be a need for an extensive infrastructure build out with blue hydrogen. Um, and the increasing amount of those pipelines will disturb the earth and come with water quality threats like stream crossings and erosion. So you might ask, these impacts don't sound great. So how could this affect West Virginia? This sounds very theoretical at the moment, but it's not. Um, news alerts and press releases from last year have indicated that there's a group of West Virginia organizations working to bring um, a blue hydrogen hub to the region. And before you get caught up on this news article headline saying clean hydrogen hub, um, I will go ahead and skip to the next slide so that we can understand why are they calling this a clean hub. And that's because in the bipartisan infrastructure bill, um, there was a clean hydrogen hub program and it has funding for hubs across the country, most of which are green hydrogen, which has no emissions, is expected to have lower cost. But one of the hubs in that provision are required for blue hydrogen or fossil fuel based hydrogen with the carbon capture component. Um, the hub has requirements to produce a certain amount of clean hydrogen per day, and um, particularly important is that definition of how much um, carbon dioxide emission can come to be considered a clean hub has actually increased since the bill passed. So I want to get too caught up in these numbers now. You'll have access to this later, um, but the point of this slide is to show that already the process to apply for these hubs is in the works. And um, 
the application that features West Virginia, the Appalachian Regional Clean Hydrogen Hub, um, has already received an encouraged notification where renewables is not a feedstock. It's focused solely on blue hydrogen. Um, so this Appalachian Regional Clean Hydrogen Hub has partners across West Virginia, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Kentucky, including dozens and dozens of corporate partners, um, including one of which is a, a corporate partner for the Mountain Valley Pipeline. Uh, the feedstocks of this hub that is proposed is for fossil fuels and carbon capture and storage. And um, already they've received an encouraged notification from the Department of Energy to submit a full application this coming April. And we won't know if West Virginia gets this uh, blue hydrogen hub with the risk of the previous impacts that we've detailed until fall of 2023, but already we've seen press releases from our senators um, connecting some of the uh, developments in the region to the potential for the hub, such as the new core steel mill, steel mill that'll be in Mason County um, and bills that passed the legislature just this year that will open pore space in um, state forests for carbon dioxide sequestration. So um, at this time, I'll go ahead and pass it to my colleague to talk about how should we be engaging with this and, and um, opportunities for taking action. Thanks so much for that, Morgan. Um, so as our decision makers are engaging with this discussion, specifically around blue hydrogen, there's a lot, as Morgan showed in the previous slide, that we really need to be considering carefully, everything from health to water to climate to community level impacts, but most importantly, we need to be thinking about these cumulatively. It's a, it's an entire life cycle from, um, as Morgan described, from, uh, from start to finish that has significant impacts. And some of the things that we should be considering include increased protections for our communities. Um, there's a lot of regulations that allow for harms to be perpetuated, including um, the lack of fracking radioactive byproducts to be considered a hazardous substance. Um, so we also need to consider supporting public health initiatives such as the classification of these waste byproducts as hazardous. Um, but most importantly, I think that we need to really focus on the just equitable transition that needs to happen in our labor industry here in West Virginia and, and really Appalachia as a whole to make sure that there are family supporting sustainable jobs renewable energy sector. So we've been working with our friends of the Blue Green Alliance to consider what some safe labor guardrails might look like, not just for blue hydrogen production, but hydrogen products, uh, projects overall. And so some of the things that we should consider um, include making sure that displaced workers are uh, prioritized in terms of retraining for these new ind industry sectors. So uh, specifically, this would be like coal miners who are out of work as we transition to new forms of energy. Um, folks should be hired from the immediately impacted communities. And we need to make sure that these jobs that support these industries are well-paid family supporting union jobs. And we need to make sure that um, funds for these projects are uh, specifically labeled to not be able to oppose union activity. Um, so some other further guardrails that be could be considered include making sure that the training for apprenticeship programs in these types of industries are nationally recognized so we can help develop young folks within our workforces to make sure they have accredited qualifications. Um, we need to make every attempt to limit workplace exposure to toxic emissions and make sure that we prioritize domestic content and construction um, using supply chain reporting. So there's a lot that you can do to get involved around this issue. Um, the first one would be to continue learning more about the impacts of this new energy uh, source, um, specifically blue hydrogen and how it impacts our state. We have a link here to um, our website where you can learn more information and also see the full graphic that um, our friends at the Ohio River Valley Institute helped us produce um, for this work. Uh, you can also continue to take action by signing up for our action alerts and um, paying attention for other uh, science and justice-based advocacy opportunities around solutions that protect our climate, health, water, and communities. And perhaps most importantly, you can make sure to talk about this with your friends, share what you've learned um, about these topics as it becomes available on social media and make sure you tag us when doing so. 
So we compiled a lot of data when putting together these resources and they're listed here, um, though we'll also link you to um, the, the one pager that we've developed about these resources and you can go to our website and actually click each one of these as a link to, to follow for more information. So uh, feel free to reach out to Morgan and I uh, if you have any questions. Um, again, there's the website where you can learn more information and find those resources. And with the minutes we have left, we'll open it up for, uh, for conversation and questions.